So the the Tuatha de Danann, let's speak of them. Uh, they had different uh, names, but they were said to be a human, beautiful, shining, like the fairies, the fae. Uh, um, they they uh, inhabited the Celtic lands for a long time until finally the humans came and uh, took over. And so then they allowed the humans to take over and they went underground, probably into underground cities. Um, uh, those mounds were called the Shea. Uh, S I D H E. Uh, we wouldn't pronounce it that way, but that's how it was pronounced in the ancient world. And so they even became called Shea. Uh, um, but again, these were glorious beings, highly aware, educated, luminous with light from the inside out, who had their own culture, much as we think of the elves today, like the ones in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, so beautifully portrayed in those movies um, by Peter Jackson, the Shea or the Tuatha de Danann were the fairy folk. Uh, they were tall, they uh, were elegant, they were conscious, they were aware. You see the flying symbols on the ankles, much as we see with, with uh, Hermes or Mercury uh, and so forth. Um, so here's Freya in the Norse lands. And again, we see the winged helmet and this point in the middle, you know, talking about, you know, um, is she one of the the bird tribe people one of the people who came out of the sky this is sudra goddess of the sun uh, again is this a, a crown or is this representational of her halo or her having activated her light body very good question uh, and you can see her symbols the sunflower so you know, uh, it, I think it has to do with the luminosity, but there was a luminosity to the Anunnaki. Um, this is an Indian culture. Certainly we know that there are civilizations in the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, and other planets that are these grand, very peaceful uh, cultures. But there are stories throughout the Indian culture of the visitation of some of these beings. And they're said to have been, you know, 20 feet tall, 35, 30 feet tall. Here's Shiva and he has many symbols. There's the snake of Kundalini awakening, the sickle moon that uh, represents the um, the movement, the, you know, the moon uh, is the quickest moving celestial body in our solar system. It uh, has many phases from the dark moon to the waxing, the waning, the full moon and so forth. So there's a lot of reasons why the moon is one of his symbols. It has to do with being a god of change, a god of uh, death and then um, transformation, alteration, uh, because, you know, if nothing died, nothing new could ever be born. You have to um, allow this alchemical transformation to take place. Uh, and we see other symbols like the trident. Here is the, the trinity, the, the, uh, the white cow. They don't kill cows in India, as most of us know. Thank goodness for the cows. They treat them with great respect. Durga. We see the same trinity uh, clearly um, from the same advanced culture. Uh, Durga has is depicted with many arms. She's both a goddess of love, but also a goddess of war, much like we hear Sekhmet being. Uh, she's uh, linked like Sybil uh, in the Groman to the uh, to the lions and the, to the tigers. She's usually shown. Um, uh, riding a tiger or lion, uh, much as Freya is up in the Norse, much as Sybil is in the Roman, where she has a chariot being pulled by lions. So again, you know, are these the same goddesses? Are they actually different goddesses? Have they are they goddesses from the same tribe? Uh, again, you have to look at the symbols. In in this in this situation, Durga, I actually really love Durga. She's great. Uh, in my mystery school, we had a saying, you know, we should have bumper stickers saying, what would Durga do? Because she certainly can uh, be the goddess of love and compassion and kindness who spins the universe into being here. Um, 
who offers a lotus flower of enlightenment, who sounds the conch shell of awakening. But, you know, she can also kick ass and take names. So she can cut uh, through the bullshit with the, with the sword of truth. You know, she uh, has perfect aim. She has the, the mace that says, you know, if you uh, uh, err on the side of, of untruthfulness, you know, we'll call you out on this. So uh, what would Durga do? She's the perfect goddess for, for all occasions, you know. Uh, the Native American white buffalo calf woman, it was actually said, uh, I've been told by uh, Native elders, she was actually blue-eyed and blonde, uh, unlike how we think of her today. Uh, and she came supposedly from the Pleiades. Uh, her story is a, a powerful story that uh, some say 9,000 years ago when the people were still recovering from the flood and starving, uh, she appeared to them and uh, she taught them the seven sacred rites of the of the people or of the Sioux people, uh, which included the Anipi Sweat Lodge, where you go in and you literally listen and attune your heartbeat with the heartbeat of the earth, which is the uh, seven point, I think it's 7.6 megahertz, which is the, uh, the, the cycle heartbeat of all great healers. Uh, she taught them the um, keeping of relatives, the keeping of the soul of the dead, the, uh, for a year you had to become a holy person to do that, the making of blood brothers, uh, the um, uh, sun dance ceremony uh, where the, you dance for four days and four nights hoping to make this divine connection with the celestial kingdoms and she also taught them the chinupa ceremony which is about keeping the masculine and the feminine in balance the stem is the masculine the bowl is the feminine uh, you know the eagle feathers that come from it have to do with honoring the winged and the four leggeds and the animals and the wood of the stem has to do with honoring the, the trees and the standing people and when you put your male and female together in balance in the world and send your prayers to heaven with the spiral of the smoke going up, then, you know, you'll be connected with the universe. And um, these were all great teachings. And she predicted she would come back at the end of this age. So uh, these are all teachings that were brought from the star people. Then we have the Kachinas. The Native Americans talk about these tall beings that come down from the mountains, much as, you know, Moses with the, you know, Mount Sinai or Mount Carmel or Mount Hermon, many of these great mountains. And many times they disguise themselves so that the people, you know, won't really see exactly what they look like, but they bring wisdom. Tall beings from the sky who met the people on top of mountaintops. And that you could call these the bird tribe people uh, because they, you know, they had the ability to fly, whether literally or in ships themselves. So what can we surmise from the things we've looked Looked at these beings, they look human. Every one of these beings, with the exception of the Kachinas that have mask on, they look human. But they are bigger than us. They live longer than us because the same beings come back again and again over thousands of years in many different cultures. They had the ability to travel all over the world because we see them everywhere. And sometimes they appear to be the same being but in different cultures with a different name. They had advanced technology, uh, things that our ancestors didn't really understand but tried to describe. They had knowledge that we didn't have and they shared some of that knowledge with us. They were teachers to mankind and they might even have the ability to shape shift because we, we see some of this described in um, especially the Greek and the Roman literature where Zeus, for example, is chasing a human girl and, you know, she changes into one thing, he changes into another to follow her and so forth and so on. In addition, they appear to be very telepathic to be able to communicate mind to mind much as we hear that many of the extraterrestrials can do today, they seem to have the ability, uh, at least some of them, to send dreams to humans to enter our minds and help give us visions or dreams, whether they do that through, you know, mental, uh, more advanced mental powers. Um, you know, we use, what, 7 to 10% of our brain on a good day. So um, uh, that would tend to indicate that uh, perhaps there's a lot more... Um, you know, 
capacity that we have to be able to affect and to uh, use our minds than we're currently using. And they obviously had more access to their brains. And they did actually seem to be concerned about the welfare of society. And this is one thing that uh, is very disturbing for me in the UFO movement today. There's a lot of wonderful researchers out there and I, I honor all of them. But there's a whole fear-based agenda that we are being sold uh, by Hollywood, by the cabal, by the shadow government, by the people who really don't want us to make friends with the extraterrestrials. They want to keep us in fear because fear allows them to control us. And there's even been talk that they have uh, long been building up to the whole idea of, um, you know, improving their technology to the point where they have their own UFOs, which they do today. And they uh, stage abductions to scare the bejeebers out of people with their own military personnel, which we know there are lots of reports about that. Stephen Greer has talked about that. Melissa Le Leslie in LA, another UFO researcher, has talked about that. Um, but um, they actually may be planning to stage a coup with holographic technology where it looks like they're going to take over the world in order for us to, just like 9-11, to say, uh, oh, in the name of safety and security, you know, we give up our rights. We allow ourselves to be searched at airports and just, you know, micromanaged to the point that, you know, not a dollar passes through the radiation screens, but that they know it. And so I think that this is one of the big concerns is that, you know, if these extraterrestrials wanted to take over the world, they certainly could have done so. Anybody who's got, you know, faster than light technology is way ahead of us. But I think that the powers that be have an agenda to keep us in fear and that they really might want to try to stage something like this if we're not wise enough to uh, really realize what's going on, which is why seminars like this are so important. Uh, a lot of these races are really uh, so much more advanced than we are in spirit and in consciousness, not to mention technology, uh, that, that they should be our teachers and we should be opening up to welcome uh, learning what we can from them, which is why I think they make contact with people at a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, like myself, I've had contact since I was a little girl, and I've had very, very benevolent, positive experiences with real high consciousness teachers, which is why I teach today and try to spread this information. So when we go back to the Bible, we also have what appears to be mostly positive tales, uh, because these beings appear to come in really important times in world history. And again, you can see the angel wings and the luminous beam of light, you know, talking with the humans here. So for example, there was the angel that appeared to Daniel in the lion's den. This is when the Hebrews had been taken into custody in ancient Persia uh, or Babylon, sorry, in Babylon. And, you know, the Babylonians were trying to decide who to who to let live and who not to let live. And they wound up letting all the Jews live for 50 years. They didn't let them build physical temples, but they let them go their own way. And in part, it was because of this remarkable thing that happened where this angel appeared behind Daniel and the lions didn't eat him, basically. And then, of course, we have the appearance of the of the angel during, you know, the uh, to the shepherds in the field. We have angels that appeared to be totally human. Uh, so when I talk about shape-shifting, if they're normally 15 feet tall and you can shrink yourself down to you know seven feet tall uh, that appears to be shape-shifting of some sort um you know Abraham offered him tea if you remember and uh, the whole story where they tell him he's going to be the father of nations but actually you know uh, he was too old I think Sarah was like I don't remember what it was, you know, 70 years old or something like that. So she wasn't, you know, menstruating anymore and he probably wasn't like so potent anymore. And so basically when she got pregnant, it was, as they said in the Old Testament, because the Lord came into her. That's a nice way, uh, a, a sanitized way of saying, you know, she was artificially inseminated or, um, probably didn't actually physically have sex with an extraterrestrial because she was a little too old, but they artificially inseminated her. And then that's when she had, you know, um, uh, Jacob. So, um, or uh, it was, was it Isaac? 
right. Uh, I think it was Isaac, who was the father of Jacob. So then we have the story of the of the angel that appeared in the Garden of Eden. This is another kind of critical story uh, in a lot of the Judeo-Christian literature. The angel that tells Abraham to spare Isaac. So this was his son, Isaac, his only uh, son until, you know, uh, I think um, the... Uh, yeah, it was his only son by Sarah. So he actually wouldn't have been the sperm donor. I want you guys to notice that it would have been the the extraterrestrials who were the sperm donor because, you know, uh, it wasn't happening otherwise. So then there's the story of Raphael. Many of you may know this if you're Catholic. He's one of the four archangels mentioned in the Bible where he helps this young boy who's trying to um, go by himself to get medicine to help his father get well. And Raphael shows up and gives young Tobias uh, the remedy to how to heal the sickness for his father. Uh, the angelic messenger Gabriel that comes to Mary during the Annunciation to announce the, the fact that she also has an, an immaculate conception. In other words, the Lord came into her. You know, how did that happen? I mean, it's certainly possible that someone with enough spiritual energy could, you know, literally uh, activate uh, an ovum in a woman. Uh, we do know that there are other um, cases of immaculate conception. But if there is no father sperm donor, the child is always born a female and she's always a clone of the actual mother because that's the only DNA that's available. However, if the father offers his genetic material or the extraterrestrial offers their ma genetic material, then suddenly, you know, you, you can have a male or a female and you have a completely unique combination or uh, being. So it's quite possible that Mary was artificially inseminated uh, by these great lords of light, whether energetically or you know, physically, in order to create a body that uh, was genetically able to hold the spirit of someone like Issa or Jesus, uh, because you know a higher consciousness soul coming uh, needs a higher consciousness body. Um, so, of course, then there are also uh, angels that sent dreams to Joseph, uh, Jesus's you know uh, father or legal father, uh, to flee to Egypt so that they would not be killed. Uh, so some people have called these messengers angels, and that's actually what angels mean. And I talk about that. And I also have spoken in some of my presentations where I actually show all sorts of pictures of light beings that are not physical. So I think it's important for people to realize that there are higher dimensional light beings that are guides who that are what we think of as classic angels. In other words, they're, they're not taking, you know, they haven't been down to the third dimension. They haven't taken third dimensional form. And I talk about this in this upcoming book. Uh, there are spirit guides. There are guardian angels. There are beings on the other side that help the universe to run. However, the question becomes when we talk about some of these stories are are these beings we're calling angels are they fifth dimensional beings uh, that are taking human form are they fourth dimensional beings that are coming into third dimension or are they third dimensional beings who have the capacity to fly and to perform extraordinary feats and who glow with light. And I think all of the above is true. And this is one of the reasons why I think it is very difficult for normal UFO researchers to understand, unless you have a spiritual component in your uh, uh, cosmology, to understand this bigger picture. So this is why they stick with the metallurgical samples, um, because, you know, it's third dimensional and it's safe and, you know, it's like the Romans, we can bite on it, you know, all that. But um, this is why when you have people who are on this bigger page of understanding the multidimensional nature of reality, uh, you can begin to realize that there are beings, light beings, he can come down, coalesce a third dimensional body or third dimensional spaceship for a period of time and then move off. Uh, there you go, the less you need technology. Uh, and at these higher levels, <coughs> some of these spaceships actually <coughs> have an organic component, a communication component, as well as a technological component. And you have to be in a deep state of mind in order to interface with this. In other words, the little chatty beta brain consciousness that we know of is not going to really allow you to 
um, run them. <clears throat> you have to know how to drop your brainwaves into alpha or theta in order to do so. Now other people have called them giants and you can see this is a, a picture from the National Museum in Athens, Greece and you can just kind of get if this guy this old guy was standing up here he'd probably come up to Zeus's waist so you know uh, obviously you know about twice as tall as us perhaps in another age we may have even called them gods and um, you know that's what the ancients called them for a long time they called them gods and then it got, got moved over at some point to um, the good god the, the good gods and the bad gods depending on what political side you're on then it became the god most high that would have been Zeus or Ninhurta or Enlil his father and then it became anybody that wasn't on his side became an angel that was on his side that wasn't going to be called a god he became a singular god with a big G and all the others became angels that were supporting him on his throne and the ones that were against him became you know demons and so this is where I, it's just so tricky because all this has been twisted and because we lost so much with the burning of our history with the burning of the Library of Alexandria and um, uh, by the Christians and by the Arabs it you know it's you know we're really having to do diligence we're having to really reconstruct our history it's kind of like we got a historical lobotomy so no wonder it's confusing some especially in the UFO world today like David Icke for example you know he was initially you know he's a reporter I'm sure he's a good reporter and charismatic guy and has done some good reporting history however he you know wasn't a mystic he didn't have encounters and he just immediately jumped to the fact that the Anunnaki must be reptilians well they're they're not reptilians every picture you see they're humans okay uh, humans with wings sometimes and humans without but you know unfortunately he misled a lot of people with the fear agenda that's not to say that there aren't reptilians among many other humanoid races that's not to say that there's not a fear agenda and a shadow government that's true too but let's not confuse one with the other and I think that's just really critical you know uh, I'd say 90% of the extraterrestrials are very good very benevolent and want only what's best for us 10% are you know the bad apple as with as with anything and they have their own self-serving agenda it's unfortunate that uh, I think the US government has gone into business with the bad apples instead of the good apples and uh, that's something that uh, has allowed them to you know develop technology have black budgets and keep everything secret and kill people in the name of um, you know power basically and m most of the people who are running this country today don't really even uh, know uh, what to do about them they're not on the inside of this cabal they're on the outside as well so that's whole, the whole shadow government piece so you know when they call them oppressors it's very easy to for the shadow government to make someone else the enemy uh, because they don't want us looking at them as the enemy they want to be the one that using fear power and control like 9-11 suddenly you know we all are willing to lay down all of our human rights because um, you know protect us protect us against the big big bad aliens and this is why in Hollywood you know all these big movies and there's some great movies out there uh, I mean Independence Day is wonderful but every single one of them are show the aliens as being the invaders and uh, except for Steven Spielberg's you know great alien movie uh, the ET that kind of got under the radar uh, thank goodness uh, I think they're going to be releasing that um, and then you've got Paul the little great alien smoke the doobie out in the for you know the woods that was a silly ridiculous movie but you don't have any movies that are really talking about what's really really going on which is positive benevolent beings who want to help us and our own shadow you know controllers are uh, trying to prevent that from happening and so it's really important for us to be discerning I think when we are investigating all of this um, I think we have to uh, really keep an open mind uh, look at the evidence um, and you know uh, 
stay open to the possibility that something wonderful could happen, uh, but that the darkness that's being projected onto the ETs is our own darkness. Uh, it's, it's the darkness of the manipulators who are themselves dark, who want us to fear the others for fear that we will wake up within the dream that they've created. So when we look back, we can see clear evidence that there are plenty of human ETs. They look just like us, more or less, uh, with small differences. They were clearly teachers for humanity. They set up the great mystery schools. They were civilization makers. This is a beautiful statue in New York City, just absolutely incredible, of Hermes or Thoth or Mercury. And again, you see the caduceus here, one of the symbols within the great mystery school of spiritual enlightenment and awakening. Now, there are many names for them. The, Hebrews called them the Anakim, uh, we call them the Anunnaki, the Ananaj, the Watchers, um, the Nephilim, the Ijiji, and the Gregory, and there's slight differences, you know. The Watchers, uh, we can say that the Watchers are uh, beings that were actually on Mars waiting for the gold shipments and they were watching for the gold shipments and eventually they did come to uh, the Earth uh, when Mars conditions became so terrible they couldn't stay there and some of them took human wives and um, you know basically their children then grew up and started doing whatever they wanted and their children were giants and those then were uh, censored or censured by um, Enlil and those became what we think of as the Nephilim and the, then the Ajiji. Some would say they're the same or the Ajiji or Gregory are supposedly the half human uh, demigods basically. And so, um, you know, again, like any uh, person that has um, a total power unless you're very enlightened you can misuse your power so uh, so we want to ask who were those gods and where did they come from now depending on how much time we have I'll be talking more about them here but they did come the Anunnaki at least came from a planet called Nibiru which in Akkadian it means a ford or a ferry or a place of transition because it was the the planet of the crossing so here's the symbol for the Sun the circle with the earth with the uh, dot at the center here's the ecliptic the flat horizon here's our you know north and south pole the, the four directions and they came from the south pole they always approach from antarctica that's when the first time we would see them and so it was the planet of the crossing uh, and it's because the planet nibiru crossed between two suns or two solar systems we've discovered that 85 percent of all the stars out there are a double sun so are we a double sun or a single well we've all thought we were a single but in fact, the ancient records tell us that we have a brown dwarf that uh, is a pulsar. A pulsar is a sun that got uh, so hot it then kind of collapsed on itself. And so it supposedly this has five planets and one of the planets winds up crossing between the two suns. So their sun is called Solaris, where our sun is called Sol. Um, so the planet of the crossing, so they come in periodically around every 3,600 years, at least according to the way that Zachariah Sitchin translated the Sumerian cuneiform tablets. And so they don't just go around quite on the same flat plate, they're at an angle, they're at a crossed angle, which is why the planet of the crossing. This is uh, uh, a plate by Zachary Sitchin, the late great Zachary Sitchin. Uh, I knew him, he was a colleague of mine and Williams and uh, others that have been in this field for a long time. Um, he was uh, a profound researcher, uh, a Jewish scholar, and one of about 10,000 people on the planet that could read Sumerian cuneiform. Uh, he wrote a 10 book series uh, called the Earth Chronicle series. I think it started coming out in 75 or 76, uh, but really, really important information because he was able to translate these texts in light of current inventions. If we tried to translate these 100 years ago, we wouldn't understand things like rocket ship, a missile, uh, airplane, flying machine, um, you know, we just wouldn't even understand what that meant because we didn't have those things in our, in our cultural uh, data banks. They didn't exist. So it's only been during the 20th century that we became advanced enough that we could begin to understand what 
the Sumerian texts were even saying to us. This is the sun, and here are the different planets around the sun. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Did I count that one? I don't think so. Eleven. So eleven. So he, he has a book called The Twelfth Planet, talking about the fact that we're the twelfth planet. And of course, I think that uh, also includes the moon. So these are some of his books. And um, you, know, you can get them used. You can get them in paperback. You can get on Amazon. Uh, they're really interesting. But if you had only one to read, I would recommend the book of Inky. So this story begins about 438,000 years ago in what's called the Zeb Tepe or the first First time, okay, and uh, um, this is a, a time basically that is discovered and discussed in these Sumerian cuneiform clay tablets and thank goodness that they did it this way because parchment and paper as we know burns and it deteriorates over time and can get mold and fall apart but clay and stone is more lasting and more durable. Uh, they settled an area they first came to earth and settled this area in the Mesopotamian Valley. Um, their very first um, city was called Eridu which means home far away and they settled in what was called the Fertile Crescent which is at the intersection of four great rivers, the Euphrates, the Tigris, um, the Pishon, and I, I can't ever remember the fourth one, but uh, three of them are still active today and the fourth one is dried up. But it was right on the Persian Gulf, okay, and this whole area was not sand as it is today. It's where, this is where, you know, um, uh, Iran and Iraq are today, which is mostly desert, and that's because of the conflict that happened uh, around 2150 BC, where this whole area kind of got bombed or nuked and radiation destroyed and spoiled the land. But for thousands and thousands of years, this was a gorgeous, gorgeous fertile crescent area, and we can see that Assyria grew up here in Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, the, the uh, Babylon grew up in this area, Sumer grew up in this area, and then we see it's close to what we think of the Holy Land today, Cana and Jerusalem. This is where Egypt would have been. So when they left this area and crossed over the Hebrews, uh, the Red Sea, they would have wandered around in the desert if they 40 years was actually accurate or not just a literary adage. Uh, they would have wandered on here. And then if you remember in the Old Testament, they were the Hebrews were told to go kill every man, woman, chicken, pig, and goat and rape all the virgins. And this was you know supposed to be law activity. Well, I, I don't really think that they did that. As I talk about in my Sophia book, uh, there's a lot of evidence that they created about 40 peaceful settlements, hillside settlements, um, and we know they were Jewish because they didn't have any pig bones, uh, and so we know that pigs uh, ho uh, were outlawed to eat. Um, and a lot of, in my research on these books, I discovered that a lot of the songs, some of the things in the uh, Old Testament book of Psalms that's attributed to David, uh, a lot of the customs were actually Canaanite customs. And the Canaanites honored the Divine Mother and the Divine Father. And um, of course, it's quite possible that there were some battles, like the Battle of Jericho, we hear with the horn where the walls fell down. But uh, I think that a lot of the uh, horrible things we read about in the Old Testament uh, where the Hebrews were told to be such horrible aggressors and murderers, uh, it's quite possible that that was actually created later uh, to give a sense of strength and uh, national identity, uh, like don't mess with us, to the Hebrews. Uh, of course, there were battles where uh, the Hebrews were conquered by Persia, uh, the upper kingdom around, uh, I think, 722 BC, and then uh, the lower kingdom, Judea, actually fell around uh, five, I think around 570 or something to uh, the ba Babylonians. And so um, the um, so you know there definitely were some wars that were going on in this area, <coughs> but this is of course where Jerusalem is today, <coughs> and you know the holy cities and all those the infightings going on over there, which really seems so crazy since there's lots of land on the earth, but it's because this land was being fought over. Um, 
by these different tribes so long ago that it's almost like the field, the ley lines are twisted in this area and it's generations of killing and killing and killing and a lack of forgiveness and uh, it's just really sad because um, this was probably one of the cradles of civilization on our planet. We see the Hittite empires up here so it kind of gives you <coughs> an idea of how it all was. Um, so the these Sumerian clay tablets were discovered in the city of Nineveh which we just saw was actually up here um, around 1820 something like that and um, they basically we found over a hundred thousand of them but there were 22,000 that were found in the temple enclosures that were talking about the history of the gods and the history before the flood and even after the flood so we know that <coughs> Um, this area um, became repopulated after the Great Flood, which took place about probably 12,000 years ago, 11,500, 600 years ago. You know, it, it, so much of the earth was wiped clean. It was destroyed. We had to start over. So we know these first settlements and begin in this area again around 6,000 BC. That's about 8,000 years ago. Uh, in the second and third millennium BC, Nineveh became a religious center devoted to Ishtar and to other gods. Gods. In 1820, Nineveh was mapped by British archaeologist Claudius Rich, but it was not until 1847 that the palace of Sennacherib was discovered when the young British adventurer Austin Henry Layard unearthed the great palace of King Sennacherib, along with a library of over 22,000 uh, cuneiform documents. So this is a, a picture of King Sennacherib, totally looks human, you know, doesn't really look taller than, well, maybe he's a little taller. Yep, I'd say he's a little taller. So you can see the, sh the um, shoulders here and the shoulders here. So maybe if these guys are, I'm just making this up six foot, maybe he's, you know, a foot and a half, two feet, maybe he's an eight footer or something like that. Um, this is a picture of the palace <coughs> that they discovered, quite incredible. And again, we've got these huge winged bearded dudes that definitely come out of the Sumerian culture, but then we've got winged guys and the tree of life over here. There's a lot to be said about it. The palace's interior walls were paneled with huge stone slabs carved in relief with images of King Sennacherib's victories. Here one could see the king and the army, foreign landscapes, conquered enemy cities, including a remarkably accurate depiction of the Judean city of uh, Lachesh, whose destruction by the Assyrians was recorded in, in Second Kings. And so um, so there definitely were some wars going on at that time. Inscribed in cuneiform on the colossal sculptures in the doorway of his throne room was King Sennacherib's own account of his siege of Jerusalem. It differed from the biblical camp some details but confirmed that Sennacherib did not capture the city. So look again at the size here in the drawing of a human. He'd come up to like the first knuckle on these big dudes, okay? They're pretty large. This find generated a great deal of excitement because it meant the increased increasing religious doubts and scriptural revisionism of the mid 19th century. That would be, you know, uh, mid 1800s. It gave Christian fundamentalist and independent corroboration of a biblical event. And, you know, we've been searching for them ever since. Written in the doorway of the very room where King Sennacherib may have issued his order to attack. And you can see that the um, Assyrians and the Hittites and the Sumerians and Babylonians, all these guys are carrying the shin. They're carrying the implements that they then learned from the gods, uh, the Sumerian gods. Gods. So this is a little bit of a timeline around 705 BC King Sennacherib established Nineveh as the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Large-scale construction work begins including building the largest palace of its time which was 42,000 kilometers large. I mean that is just like what the heck with at least 80 rooms that's gigantic. In 650 BC under King Urshabanipal and I like Urshabanipal and you'll see why because he was probably the first you know 
archaeologist. Uh, a new palace is constructed together with a large library and it's in large part because of Urshabhanapal that we have these records today. Sumerian cuneiform texts found in the library palace tell the story of the Anunnaki gods and of their planet Nibiru and you can see how cool the writing looks here. Of course we can't read it but this is probably one of the first writings on the whole planet and there are people who've compared this to things in the in Tibetan and in, in the Nakhal language of Lemuria and in uh, that has been found in Mexico and Central America so pretty interesting so one of the the we have some really great books the Enamut Elish is one and the Atrahasis is one the Enamut Elish is the Babylonian epic of creation and here we see you know part of the text of it seven tablets of the history of creation and these were read every new year actually on January the 6th which we in Christianity we conscripted that to make it the day of the epiphany where the magi went to visit Jesus but it was originally a, a, a holy day where they read this story for thousands of years about the coming of the gods and how the gods kind of seeded the earth and so forth and it, it, it lays out this whole thing that uh, it looks like a celestial struggle or struggle between a celestial god and a celestial monster. So it tells of a great collision between the planets Nibiru and Tiamat and that's where the asteroid belt was long ago and according to them it goes back 510 million years ago and this tore apart the planet Tiamat basically creating the asteroid belt which was called the hammered bracelet in a lot of the ancient literature and uh, also created Phobos which is a very beaten up little moon of Mars and the Earth so it spun the core of Tiamat out according to these texts okay as wild as this might sound to people and that ultimately became uh, it moved inside of Tiamat's orbit to take on the orbit that became the Earth so astronomer Alessandro Morbidi Morbid Morbid, Morbidelia, Delhi, sorry, of France's observatory in France, the Cota Azure, says there was a, a celestial collision involving a supplemental planet that would be Tiamat that had existed where the asteroid belt is now. He believes it happened about 3.9 billion years ago, so he places it much further back, and that these events explain the unusual long elliptical plant orbit of the phantom planet. So I want you to get that this is an astronomer, mainstream astronomer speaking about the fact that there is a phantom planet that is going in this elliptical uh, space and that we, uh, that it exists and that there was a planet where the asteroid belt is which is does not take a brain scientist to figure out. The Sumerians wrote of an advanced civilization on a planet named Nibiru that had been in a different solar system than Earth and it circled around the pulsar called Solaris. So this is, you know, we're, this isn't made up. This is all stuff that literally was passed down through thousands of years by the gods of their history that we have recorded going back 8,000 years in our history that we only discovered in the early 1800s and we only kind of got translated in the last hundred years. So that's what this is about. This pulsar was a star before it collapsed and was the sun around which Nibiru had once orbited. The celestial lords also told the Sumerians that water could be found on Neptune, Uranus, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Jupiter's moons and the rings of Saturn as well as on asteroids and comets as well and this is all something that is now confirmed by NASA. The Sumerians lacking telescopes could only get such a concept from those whose astronomical knowledge knowledge far exceeded their own. Today our astronomers have confirmed all these things. The Sumerian creation epic lends compelling evidence for the extraterrestrial settlement of Earth by human astronauts who came to be regarded as the ancient gods of planet Earth. So the word Anunnaki literally means those who from the heavens came and I love this graphic. I think it's so wonderful with the heavens behind and the tree of life and you've got winged Anunnaki and non-winged Anunnaki with this flying uh, disc or ship with whether it's solar panels or just symbolic we don't know. So this is the fairy planet of course and it was because it ferried between that sun and this sun and of course later they became known as the fairies didn't they but we spell the fairies different F-A-I-R-E-S uh, so because it ferries between the inner and the outer solar system. So um, 
this is a symbol that's found around the world and I'm going to show it to you now in its various forms and so it doesn't always look exactly like this but pretty close this is for example a derivative of it and you can see the eight-pointed star with the ninth in the middle uh, the ninth are the Aeneid of course uh, and here it is in the crossing of St. Peter's Square this is clearly not a square guys it's a circle and here's the Sun in the middle and this is where the obelisk is that we're so familiar with. We've got the four directions here. And then we've got the cross, the Earth cross, that is Nibiru. And we can see it very clearly here at the Vatican. So, of course, the Vatican knew all this stuff. You know, uh, the, the, this was taught within the mystery schools. Everybody knew this stuff. But then what happened once the... God Most High became God with a big G, they set out to basically um, uh, murder anybody that had this knowledge and to conscript it for their own so that most people don't know why in the world they built this the way they built it. We also see it here planet X, you're talking about the planet of the crossing, and we see it in this tarot card where we're talking about the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune has to do with the cycles of time and how periodically this planet comes back and sometimes it, it's, it really brings wisdom or knowledge. This would be the Sphinx here because they are teachers of mankind. You can see it's the 10 card of all things and sometimes of course, you know, it brings asteroids and comets and meteors and all sorts of things that create chaos and <clears throat> And it comes specifically during four ages. These are the four fixed ages. Aquarius the man, Taurus the bull, Leo the lion, and um, Scorpio the eagle, the high end. And you see there's a book of knowledge in every one because when the gods have returned, every time there seems to be an upgrade to humanity in terms of knowledge or culture or wisdom or, or science or the, of, or the arts. And here's the Vatican symbol very clearly they call it the chi ro but this is uh, clearly you know we're talking about the same conversation and this these are the, the you also see it in egypt these are the three tassels you'll see it in the egyptian okay where the three tassels come off of the crook and the flail okay and this was the symbol of the the pharaoh so the winged planet, we also identify this symbol. We see it on so many things in the world, uh, Bentleys and, um, you know, Aston Martins and all sorts of um, uh, secular use, commercial use. It comes right out of the, this whole idea of the winged planet, the planet that's traveling through space. And see so here Chrysler's used it. Steak and Shakes used it, many has used it. This is how it's been secularized by uh, the powers that be, people who actually know about this stuff, who are part of that cabal, and maybe some of them are enlightened beings, and uh, some of them are, you know, dastardly uh, beings that are manipulating like puppet masters behind the scenes. But we can recognize clearly this logo in these symbols. Uh, and what's so interesting is when we look at this NASA footage, Footage, this is what you're looking at is the Sun that's been covered up okay so that we can see the solar rays or the solar mass ejections coming off of the Sun the, the solar coronals but it's normally just like this a background of stars however you know you can sort of see in these images there looks like gigantic ships that look like flying you know winged beings um, being recorded by the SOHO uh, Observatory. And here again, we see close up of this, and these are gigantic cylindrical motherships. So imagine how large these darn things are. This is just absolutely incredible. I mean, if you've ever seen a picture of Venus passing in front of the sun, it looks like a teeny weeny little dot. So these are enormous I mean we you know I don't know what they are I mean hundreds of miles but um, this is pretty interesting and of course it looks very much like our winged symbol doesn't it they came here in what were called the boat of a million years in other words uh, enormous vessels that were made to last for a really really long period of time and um, as I said 3600 of our earth years equals one of theirs because a year is the amount of time it takes for your planet to orbit around the Sun obviously theirs takes a lot longer than ours so <clears throat> 
occasionally, about every 3,600 years, it's also quite possible that as, you know, a planet X comes through the, the, the Milky Way or through our solar system, that sometimes the red dwarf also may come with it because, you know, are they just going in a circle like this at a constant dis distance or is in fact the red dwarf coming closer to us, the pulsar. So, and it can bring comets and of course in the ancient world, comets uh, were always seen as harbingers of doom because uh, it, they brought meteors with them and probably because they had to move through the asteroid belt where there are a lot of meteors so they picked up a lot of meteors with the gravitational field. Um, so this is at the heart of a hypothesis attempting to explain the periodic mass extinctions which punctuate the history of life on earth. So in other words sometimes we get hit by these bombardment of meteors that like took out the dinosaur 65 million years ago. So in, 19, in 2003, an astounding discovery was announced in France in the pages of the prestigious monthly magazine called Science and Life. It published an update on the planetary makeup of our solar system in light of recent discoveries in the Kepler belt entitled, A Planet's How Many Are There in Our Solar System? So this is a an astronomer, Dr. Valerie Jeffus, who probably put her career totally on the line, made a sensational announcement. There is one more unknown planet in our solar system, a phantom planet whose possible orbit is too elongated to be seen. I expect that one day, one day we will discover a new Mars-sized planet. Dr. Jeffus told the journal with certainty a planet whose orbital period is several thousand years. He provided the journal with a sketch of the planet's elongated elliptical orbit, even indicated in the sketch where the phantom planet probably is now now. And you can see this is all in French, a planet with the original eclipse, a supplemental planet with the trajectory of um, uh, tres ecliptique, uh, don't know, that exists with the um, astronomers um, and it repeats, comes back periodically into our orbit. So, um, so it travels through Orion which of course we know Orion was very precious in the star alignments to the ancients. Lots of pyramids and things are aligned with Orion, which represented Osiris to them. Uh, this is uh, Betelgeuse uh, here. This is Rigel, the blue star Rigel. Here's the um, three stars of the belt of Orion. The Galactic Council, the center of the Galactic Council is said to be in the double star in the middle of the dagger here and then it moved through um, the the heart of um, Leo which is Regulus. In other words it wasn't actually out there in space but from our point of view from our perspective on earth it appeared to move through um, Leo the lion the heart of the lion and through um, through Orion and both of these are very important symbolic uh, constellations. Um, this is an article from 1983 in the Washington Post. They discovered a planet possibly as large as Jupiter. So it's an, a gigantic uh, uh, planet. A heavenly body possibly as large as the planet Jupiter and possibly so close to Earth it could be part of this solar system has been found in the direction of the constellation Orion by an orbiting telescope aboard the U.S. infrared astronomical satellite. So mysterious is the object that astronomers do not know if it's a planet, a giant comet, a nearby protostar that never got hot enough to become a star, a distant galaxy so young that it's still in the process of forming its first stars, or a galaxy so shrouded in dust that none of the light cast by stars ever gets through. All I can tell you is that we don't know what it is said, that's vague enough, Dr. Jerry Newton Bogger, IRAS Chief Scientist for California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Director of the Palomar Observatory in the California uh, Institute of Technology. The most fascinating explanation is this in this mysterious body, which is so cold it casts no light and has never been seen by optical telescopes on Earth, is it's a giant gaseous planet as large as Jupiter and as close to the sun as 50 million miles. Well, they may seem to be a great distance in Earthbound terms, it's a stone so in cosmological terms, so close in fact that it could be nearest to its nearest heavenly body to Earth is the nearest one beyond the outermost planet Pluto. If that's really that close, it would be a part of our solar system, he said. So this is 83. So if you notice, things have kind of gone silent since then.